Okay, well, we have a lot of fun stuff to talk about this morning. Uh, you have pretty much finished 1 Corinthians. Today you finished reading 1 Corinthians, today we're reading chapter 15 and 16. And uh, I, I think as you've been reading, you've probably had lots of moments like, what the heck? <laughs> what the heck is this? Uh, I'm so surprised that when I sent out that survey, and I said, what book would you guys want to talk about in an intensive? Would you want to talk about Romans, 1 Corinthians, or Revelation? Like, so many people said Romans. And I was like, I was so surprised that 1 Corinthians or Revelation was not picked because there's tons of what the heck moments. So uh, we will get to some of those what the heck moments. But um, first, I want to actually start with today's reading. I think um, I, I want to highlight one of the big contributions of the book of 1 Corinthians to our, our understanding of the gospel. So let me pray for us, and then we'll dive in. Father, thanks for this morning. Thanks for this place that we have every week to be able to gather together and open your word. And God, um, we ask that as we open your word, that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, and that you would reveal yourself to us in new and more true and more full ways. We love you, and we need you to pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So 1 Corinthians, Paul planted the church in Corinth. We read about that in Acts chapter 18. And he was there for, I think, a year and a half, and then um, he, he departs from this church, and he's writing to this church because um, he's addressing some issues. So this letter is different than Romans, um, one in that he's actually been there. He knows these people. He planted this church. There were a church in Rome he did not plant. He did not necessarily know them unless he encountered them on some sort of so some sort of journey along the way. So he's he has a much more intimate relationship with the church in Corinth. Uh, and also, you might have noticed, it's not like this linear argument that Paul's laying out. There's these sections of topics. The first uh, few chapters, he's talking about church division that's taking place. Uh, then he's dealing with issues regarding sex and marriage. Then he's dealing with issues around food, food that's been offered to idols, food of the communion table. Then he's dealing with issues about the church gathering together for worship. And then he concludes with issues and questions about the resurrection. So it is more topical in that fashion. This is also probably not 1 Corinthians. Um, Paul actually mentions in 1 Corinthians 5, I think, uh-oh, Verse four, five. I think it's verse nine, maybe. Oh, in verse nine, he says, "I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people." So he has written a letter to the church in Corinth. They responded with a letter to which he now, in this letter, is answering their questions. So First Corinthians, as far as the order is concerned, is actually more like Second Corinthians. It's just the first letter that is inspired in canon. So he had written a letter, they wrote a letter back, now he is responding, and that's the letter that we have here. Um, and then there's 2 Corinthians in our Bible, but it would seem from 2 Corinthians there that also clues that they respond to this letter, he responds back, and then there's um, some tension between them, and 2 Corinthians is actually more like 1 Corinthians. All that stuff is nerdy stuff that doesn't really matter as far as understanding the letter. But I have a side point. What I want to do is I want to actually start in 1 Corinthians 15. So if you want to turn there. And we are going to start there. And I have a slideshow this morning on my phone. I made this a while ago. I was, at, I was reading this morning. I was like, I think I've done something on this before. Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel, the good news. This is what he wants them to take away. Remember, at the beginning of the letter, he says, I came and I knew nothing but Christ and him crucified. That's what I proclaimed among you. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. So to highlight some words going on there, 
So the good news that I preach to you, the gospel is a message that you hear, that you receive through hearing. Uh, it's also a message of reception. You don't earn it, you don't achieve it, you receive it. But then he says, in which you stand. So the gospel is not just a past, uh, past tense event for the Christian. It's an ongoing event. You stand in the gospel. You guys, there is also that longer table back there if you wanted to slide over to. The, the young strapping boys do it. Uh, then he says, by which you are being saved. What tense is that in? Are being saved. Yeah, present tense. Present, ongoing tense. You are currently being saved by the gospel. So right here, I mean, these, these verses right here should just blow our minds as Christians to, to the idea that the gospel is something that we move on from or something that we just need to be saved, to be justified, but then we're on our own. The gospel is what is currently saving you. So on one hand, we're justified. We're declared in right standing. We're saved from the penalty of sin through the gospel, by our faith in the gospel. But then we are being saved. We're being saved from the power of sin in our life, day in and day out. And that does not happen by you mustering up your strength. It happens by you believing the gospel. So this is why gospel recitation, like reciting the gospel to yourself every day, is important. Because that is how you are currently being saved. But then he says, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. So not only is the gospel something that we stand in, something that, by which we are being saved, but something that we need to hold on to for our future salvation, our, our glorification. So from start to finish, the A to Z of the Christian life is the gospel. Now I want to highlight this. This, this seems to be a, an early Christian creed. Sorry if I'm in your way a little bit, Lauren. Um, he says, for I delivered to you as of first importance. So all these issues that he's been dealing with in this letter, they, they fall under the umbrella of importance to the gospel. The gospel is number one. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Can you guys think of any scriptures from the Old Testament? That's what he's alluding to here with the scriptures. Any Old Testament scriptures that talk about how the Messiah would die for our sins? Isaiah. Isaiah, yeah. Isaiah 53. Let me uh, keep going. Oh, 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 no, no. Maybe I skipped it. Thought I had it. Yes. Boom. Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He shall bear their iniquities. Uh, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So yeah, totally a, a verse in the Old Testament that we can point to that says the Christ is going to bear the sins of the people. But there's also this line, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. Now, can you think of any scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about how the Christ is going to be buried and raised on the third day? What Old Testament text says that? Your silence is good and right. Because there's not a verse in the Old Testament that says, the Messiah is going to be buried and then rise on the third day. So what the heck is Paul doing here? Is he getting loose and wild with scriptures? Well, no, there's more to it. So I want to talk about Christ in the Old Testament. Christ is promised in the Old Testament. That's like what we just saw with Isaiah 53. There are specific promises throughout the entire Old Testament, as we read through it this year, that promise to the coming Messiah, the king, the better David, the, uh, the shepherd of the people. So there's these promises specifically for the Messiah. Also, though, Christ is present in the Old Testament. Remember, Jesus Christ is the Word, the Word incarnate. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is God the Son. So, he is present throughout the entire Old Testament. Remember Genesis 1, in the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, the, the psalmist and even John himself, he says, you know what created everything? The Word of God. God said, let there be light. So right there on page 1, you have Jesus being present. He is present all the way through the Old Testament. But also he is patterned. He is patterned in the Old Testament. So he is promised, he is present, and he is patterned. 
This is the, the study of typology. Typology, uh, a type um, refers to, to something that prefigures a greater reality, and typology is the study of those things. If you're in the Romans class, we talked about typology. Adam, Paul says, was a type of the one to come. So don't worry about writing these down. Let me give you some nerdy definitions. Typology. Here is uh, Davidson's definition. The study of certain Old Testament salvation historical realities, like a person or an event or an institution, which God specifically designed to correspond to and be prospective, predictive, prefigurations, that's a fun one, of their absolute escalated eschatological fulfillment aspect within New Testament salvation history. That's a mouthful, is it not? Let me give you an example. So, um, uh, an event or institution. Remember that thing in the book of Exodus called the Passover lamb? Passover lamb is sacrificed, the blood covers the family, and they are, they are freed from both slavery and death. Well, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that Christ is our Passover lamb. That's typology. So that thing in the Old Testament is actually pointing towards a greater Passover lamb, which is Jesus. Or the high priest, who every year, once a year, would go into the Holy of Holies, entering into the presence of God, representing all the people. Well, the book of Hebrews says that Christ is our greater high priest. Okay? He is in the Holy of Holies year-round and will never, and never exit it again. So in that way, he's a better high priest. That's what typology is. So you guys actually all know how to do typology already. You just don't use nerdy words like this. Here's another, uh, another definition, a little less nerdy, but still pretty nerdy. An institution, that would be like the sacrificial system. An institution, person, or event, that might be like the crossing of the Red Sea, or maybe the ark going through the flood, which corresponds to the Red Sea, which corresponds to baptism, according to Peter. Or event designed to point forward in his history through its eschatological or end time fulfillment in the archetype, that is Christ and the church. So all, all types in the Bible, they find their fulfillment in Christ and the church. So that's like, there's your little t-ball set up. So if the question is, is this a type? Well, is it fulfilled in Christ and the church? If the answer is no, then it's not. <laughs> there's also though motifs when we're thinking about patterns, just the way that maybe you walk into someone's house and they have um, what are the things called? Drapes? Like drape? uh, maybe, maybe the rods that hold the drapes, like they all look the same in the house, even though the drapes are different in different rooms, but the curtain rods are the same. That's called a motif. It's a design feature, and it helps give structure to the overall pattern. So that's what a motif is, and I took that from Spark Notes. It's really helpful. Okay, so all I have to say, how do the scriptures say that the Christ would be buried and raised on the third day? The answer to that is actually biblical theology, typology. The way that this is answered is through typology. Remember Genesis 22? Genesis 22, don't read it yet. Boom. Genesis 22, that story about Isaac and Abraham, where Abraham takes Isaac up on the hill and he's going to sacrifice him, but then God provides a substitute in his place. Well, that whole story takes place on the third day. When we were in Genesis, I pointed that out and I said, don't forget this. So Genesis 22, it's a story about the beloved son, how he is offered up as a willing sacrifice. Remember, Isaac carries the wood on his back. He knows. He's not getting dragged up there. Like, he knows what's going on. He even asked at one point, he's like, where's the lamb? And his dad's like, the Lord will provide. And he's like, Dang, all right. And he keeps going. So he knows what's about to happen. And he's going up as a willing sacrifice. A substitute is then provided, and the beloved son is figuratively speaking, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, resurrected all on the third day. All on the third day. So the story of Abraham and Isaac is a story of resurrection on the third day, according to your Bible. The next one. Exodus 19 through 24. Anyone remember what those chapters are about? 19 through 24. 19 through 24. The law. It is regarding the law. Specifically, it's when God makes the covenant with the people of Israel. 
At 19, they arrive at Mount, Se mm -hmm. Mount Sinai, and it's like the, the wedding ceremony is beginning. They're like, you're like, hey, you can't touch us until we say the I do's. And then they go through all, all the vows, which are the Ten Commandments, and the other preceding uh, other laws that follow, all leading up to chapter 24, where the people say, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And then they seal the covenant with blood. Well, all of that is taking place on the third day. In Exodus 19 to 24, the glory of the Lord appears, and a covenant is made with blood on the third day. So there's some verse references if you want to write those down or search those out later. Also, Joshua chapter 1, the people of God enter into the land of promise all on the third day, according to Joshua chapter 1, verse 11, and chapter 3, verse 2. So some very significant events take place on the third day. But wait, there's more. In 2 Kings chapter 20, remember that story where Hezekiah is super sick and he's about to die? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 20, the king of Israel was raised from death, it says, on the third day. 1 Kings 20 verses 1 and also look at 5 through 6. In Jonah chapter 2, the prophet of God was delivered from Sheol, or Hades, the belly of the fish, on the third day. He spent three days and three nights, and then he spit up onto dry land, and Jesus himself says that was pointing to him. In Esther, chapters 4 through 8, remember that story, <laughs> Esther? Well, she's a royal representative, and she makes this priestly intercession with the king in his court for the life of the people all starting on the third day. If you remember, she says like, to her, her friends, she says, fast with me for three days, then I'll go in. So that means that she goes into the court's chamber on the third day to make intercession for the people. So these are biblical patterns all throughout our Old Testament of, of very significant <laughs> events taking place on the third day. So there was a biblical theology of the third day to where Paul could say that Jesus was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There's also Hosea 6. Hosea 6, Israel's hope to return from exile is described as being raised from the dead on the third day. That's Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. So, so all of these, they, they're painting a composite portrait of some sort of hope, some sort of reality. Here's how I put it all together into a statement. According to the scriptures, the anticipated and true Israel, king, royal priest, prophet, and beloved son, and willing sacrificial substitute, Jesus Christ, would be buried and raised on the third day, revealing the glory of the Lord, making a covenant with his blood to intercede for and bringing the people of God into the promised place of rest, just like Joshua. So that's why Paul can say things like this, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So, it's pretty cool stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one thing that this helps us understand is how Paul reads his Bible. That he doesn't just read it as, as verses that are mere promises, but he sees a narrative unfolding before him that's all connected. Genesis is connected to Isaiah, and 1 Kings is connected to Deuteronomy, and they all flow and work together. So it'd be like if you were a dendrologist, someone who studies trees, um, but you never saw a forest. Maybe like you walk in, you're like, ah, yes, this is a madrone. I can tell because of the way it is. Anyone? <laughs> nice. See, the people, the people <laughs> in their 20s got that. <laughs> um, it's a... Like a YouTube video, it's just a meme. Anyways, if you walked through a forest and you were really good at identifying what a tree specifically was, but never saw the actual forest, you'd be totally lost, and you wouldn't know your way out of it. So the same thing when we're reading our Bibles, we can't just become experts at one single verse, we also need to become uh, fervent students of the entire whole. Because we don't just believe that the individual words were inspired, which we do believe, but also that the entire story is what is inspired which we do. That's what's called verbal plenary inspiration. Both every part and the entire whole is inspired by God to say something. 
So the third day is historically significant, but it is also theologically and doctrinally significant. We all might know, or at least say we believe this, that right action is shaped ultimately by right doctrine. What you believe finds its legs in what you do. But we also can tell from this section of 1 Corinthians that biblical theology matters for doctrine. The, do the theological reality that Jesus was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures is a biblical theo theological reality, which means that biblical theology should matter to us. Amen? Amen. Cool. Thank you so much. All right, let's get back to 1 Corinthians. Any questions on that? A lot. I, just fired. I did that with the group, and we read all those texts, and it was like an hour and a half, and I just did it with you guys in 20 minutes. Yeah, Jeff. It's uh, uh, interesting to think about these these points in the Old Testament that you just raised. Mm -hmm. um, these are all points that are that that are in the scriptures from different authors in different time periods, sometimes hundreds, if not thousands, of years mm -hmm. apart. Mm -hmm. uh, it just. I'm just making a, uh, an observation that this speaks loudly to the supernatural yeah. orchestration of God yeah. weaving in these landmarks mm -hmm. throughout a vast period of time yeah. and um, all finding its fulfillment in, in the one. Yeah. Uh, it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah and these, these aren't just literary patterns. It's not just like uh, all, all these biblical authors are like, oh yeah, I'm getting the theme, I'm going to make this be on the third day. It's, so it's not just a literary pattern, it's also a historic redemptive pattern, where these events really are taking place on the third day, and yet these biblical authors are keying into the work of God in redemptive history, where, where they see that God is actually up to something, and, and they are highlighting that in the scriptures by, by telling us taking place on the third day. Same thing with details like he went up on a mountain. The authors don't need to tell you that, but for some reason they think that that little detail is significant not just to the historic event, but to the theological reality of what they're trying to say. I saw, yeah, Mike? Just a quick question. Yep. I, was thinking, I was thinking about the third day thing, mm -hmm. that uh, when we were in Israel, we noticed that the Jews would still traditionally worship starting on Friday. Mm -hmm. At sunset. Mm -hmm. That's and when we're, Sabbath starts. We're here today on Sunday, the third day. Yep. Yeah. We we worship on Sundays because the day that, the, that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. So we worship on the first day of the week um, rather than having. So Sabbath is always the seventh day of the week. It starts Friday at sunset and goes until Saturday at sun uh, to sunset. So that is the Sabbath day. We uh, celebrate the Lord's Day by gathering together, we share communion at times, we worship the risen Jesus, because he rose on the first day of the week, so that's why we get together on Sunday, which is three days after the crucifixion. Does he want to hand? Yeah. I would just like to say that reading through the Bible multiple times each year has pulled more of that all together in yeah. a way that is very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, like watching a TV sh show or a movie, and like the first time you watch it, you're like, oh, that was fun. But the second time, you're like, you see all these connections. Like watching Inception a few times, and then, like all of a sudden that tops means so much more to you the second time you watch it, at the beginning of the movie. Unless you're old, can't remember the other time you watched it. <laughs> <laughs> then it's always a new experience. All right, so we have about 35 minutes, and we have lots of different choose your own adventure options. We could talk about we could talk about sex. We could talk about food offered to idols. We could talk about the head coverings. We could talk about prophecy in tongues. What do you guys want to talk about? I want to talk about the prophecy in tongues. Prophecy in tongues. All right, let's do it. Chapter fourteen. Prophecy in tongues. Love it. So, uh, did you just stay in 1 Corinthians 14, but I'm actually going to go to 1 Corinthians 12, because that's really where this discussion begins. So, oh, I heard people change the page. I told you not to. Okay. 
Uh, this whole discussion starts in chapter 12, and it's this discussion around what Paul calls the spirituals. The, the word gift doesn't actually show up here. It's just the word uh, pneumatikos, which means spiritual or spiritual things. So he wants to uh, address the questions that they had concerning the spirituals. He doesn't want them to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to uh, mute idols, idols you could not speak. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaks in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is a curse. And, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So that's an important uh, foundation for discussing spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts, and gifts of the Spirit, uh, uh, manifestations of the Spirit, will never result in someone abandoning Jesus Christ as Lord. It will always resort in them worshiping Jesus Christ as Lord, proclaiming Him as the true Lord. And this is actually all referenced back to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Then he says, now there are a variety of gifts. And here's where the word gift actually uh, shows up, and it's the word charisma. So if, you, if you've heard of the charismatic movement, charismatic comes from that Greek word charisma, which is the, just the Greek word that we get uh, charis or grace from. So the word grace means gift. And one way that Paul talks about these manifestations of the Spirit is by calling them a gift. So that's why, in, at least in the ESV, he starts off by spiritual, saying spiritual gifts. They're just translating it like that because he is talking about gifts. He is talking about these spirituals, whatever they might be. And they really are gifts given by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them, them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation or, or the, the appearing of evidence of the Spirit for the common good. So these three words, gifts, service, activities, are all under the umbrella of spirituals. These spiritual manifestations in the life of the believer. So when we as Christians are exercising these God-given gifts or services or activities, uh, they are from the Spirit... And it's a manifestation of the Spirit in our life, but they're for the common good. They are not to bolster you. They are to bolster other people, to build up other people. It's for the common good of the church. So, for a very simple and practical example, a variety of activities. Did you know Ben's pretty good at guitar? There's a guitar up here. I'm not going to make him play it. Now, when Ben's just sitting at home and he's playing a guitar... That's not a quote-unquote spiritual gift. But the moment he stands up and leads us in worship for our good, it is. Because it's an inactivity for the common good. So when it comes to spiritual gifts, some things are like abilities that you possess, while other things are like tools that you might borrow. You don't always have them at all times. But both of them you use for the sake of others, and that's one of the qualifications of it being a spiritual gift. It's for the common good, Proclaim that Jesus is Lord. He goes on, for To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the works of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Oh, that's interesting. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So who determines what gifts you have? The Spirit. The Spirit. The Spirit. Good, and according to a, a, a vision, also Christ, so the trying one. Not only does the Spirit determine what gifts you have, um, he determines that each one of you has gifts. He apportions to each one individually, as he wills. He decides not only what to gift you with, but how much to gift you with. Now, when it comes to spiritual gifts, there are th some things that you will be gifted in, um, but that doesn't mean that those are the only things you do. For example, in Romans chapter 12, one of the spiritual gifts listed is generosity. 
Well, does that mean that if I don't have the gift of generosity, I don't need to be generous as a Christian? By no means. It just means that some who are gifted with the gift of generosity are really good at it. Like, they just exceed that. And maybe the way they're gifted with the gift of generosity is they've been given a lot to be generous with. So as Christians, we're all called to be generous. And yet some of us have been gifted in a way that, that makes us exceptionally good. As Christians, we are all called to evangelize, and yet some of us have the gift of evangelism to where we are exceptionally gifted at it. And maybe that means that we just don't uh, break down in fear and we're just really comfortable talking about the gospel. Or maybe that means we just see a lot of success in, in our evangelistic efforts. So your gifting... It doesn't pigeonhole you into what you can do in the church. And it doesn't say, well, I can't do those things, so I'm not gifted at it. It just means that that's where you flourish more for the benefit of others. Flourish more for the benefit of others. Now he mentions prophecy and he mentions tongues here. Remember in Acts chapter 2, tongues is clearly in Acts chapter 2, other known languages. The question in 1 Corinthians is... Is that what tongues mean, or is tongues an unknown language, a heavenly language? So that's a question that we're going to think through as we read chapter 14. And then what is prophecy? So if you remember, uh, we, we call the Old Testament, we have those books that are prophetic books, and it's when a prophet shows up and he says, Thus says the Lord, and he is speaking the very word of God to the very people of God. So it's, it's precise in its uh, verbal deliverance in the Old Testament. But that's not the only type of prophet that is in the Old Testament. We know a true prophet is one who speaks on behalf of the Lord, but those prophets, they also hold, held the office of prophet. They had more responsibilities than just being a mouthpiece for God on those certain occasions. Remember, there's Isaiah and there's Ezekiel, and like, they do these sign acts where they get tied up and they lay down and they like, scream out a little, little statue of Jerusalem, like, ah! <laughs> That's being a prophet right there, apparently. <laughs> um, but the office of prophet, they became more of, um, more like a counselor to the king. One who, one who advised the king in accordance with the word of God. So they became a counselor. Um, so there, there is variation in just the Old Testament about what a prophet is. Then when we get to the New Testament, uh, a prophet also seems to have different roles. Although in the book of Acts, there are prophets and they are speaking... Uh, Speaking a word to the people, it's, it's never, it never seems to be revered in the same way that prophets were in the Old Testament. There is never a mention of, um, of consequence for not listening to, to the prophets. So if we think about what a prophet said in the Old Testament, sometimes they talked about the future, but it's less than 10% of the time. So there's foretelling, talking about the future, but then there's forthtelling, talking about the present state condition. And that's usually what prophets were doing. They were either talking to the people about their sin, asking them to repent, or they were speaking to the people a message of comfort. Sometimes they talked about the future. But the majority of the time, the prophet was someone who either convicted with their words or comforted with their words. And it was through some sort of revelation from God. So the way uh, Wayne Grudem, if you know, he's a, he's a systematic theologian, the way he talks about prophecy in 1 Corinthians and also in the New Testament, uh, it's not that it's um, every word being inspired that the prophet speaks, but the content being inspired to comfort or to convict the people of God. So God um, seems to reveal something to uh, the people in, in a way that they wouldn't necessarily naturally know on their own, but it's for the good of the body. And that seems to be what's taking place in the book of Acts. Like, like, they get together, and they're praying, like, who should we send? And someone's like, we should send Barnabas and Paul. Where did that come from? You know, they just, like, think, yeah, I hate these guys. Let's get them out of here, you know? Or did, did someone reveal that to them? So that's, the, I think, the most general sense that we can think of prophecy in the New Testament. Also, prophecy in the New Testament is never put on par with Scripture. Um, it, 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 in Ephesians and other places... The Old Testament is referred to as being given to us by the prophets, while the New Testament seems to be referred to as being given to us by the apostles. So the apostles are the authoritative 
figure in the New Testament era, and they are giving us the written word of the New Testament, not the prophets. So whatever a prophet is in the New Testament, whether it's currently active or if it has ceased, it's not something that can ever trump Scripture. It's something that confirms Scripture and draws someone into belief of Scripture. But we'll get so he uh, then gives the metaphor of the body, and then he says, man, can we, can we all be a tongue? Can we all be an eye? Can we all be a hand? No, that would be silly. Uh, which his point is, we cannot all have the same gifts. We must have a variation of gifts in the church. And when we have a, a variation of, of gifts, that's when we will flourish most. Because my gifts are for you, and your gifts are for me. If you think I have the gift of teaching, it's for your benefit, not for mine. Like, why, how would that benefit me whatsoever if I had the gift of teaching? It's, of course, for your good and your benefit. So not to bolster me, but to build you up. And your gifts are also for the building up of those sitting around you. And everyone is a gift. Your presence is also a spiritual gift. So sometimes one of the best things you can do is show up to church. But then we get the love chapter. Love chapter is sandwiched in between this discussion of spiritual gifts because it's about spiritual gifts, not about your wedding. Sorry to disappoint you. You can totally use it at your wedding. It applies, just not to rest. Uh, also, I, I've heard it done before where people like, go to this chapter and they're like, they'll, they'll say, you know, God is love. And Jesus is God. So let's read this chapter and insert Jesus' name. And they read, read through it and they, they'll say, Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast, and he is not arrogant or rude. That's totally fine. You can do that, and all of those things are true. It's just not what this chapter is about. This chapter is about how you exercise your spiritual gifts. So looking at verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm nothing more than a noisy gong and clanging cymbal. Should I bang on the drums? Real quick, just to demonstrate. No, of course not. It'd be annoying. That's the point. It'd be so annoying. When you use a gift without love, it's annoying and harmful. So, the way you operate your spiritual gifts is with and through love for others. And if you don't have love, it's useless. Because it's for you and not for them. If I have prophetic powers, you know, he, he brings these, these two up first because this is what there's disagreement going on about in church and If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm not. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So what do you need? Love. Love is what you need. Love is all you need. Beautiful. <laughs> so the reason for this is because it says love, love never ends. Love endures forever. He even puts on par with faith, hope, and love. As Christians, we have faith in, in Christ and hope that one day we will see him face to face uh, and, and know him in full even as we've been fully known. But those things at some point will fade away and stop. Like, at some point, you won't need your hope anymore because you'll see the reality face to face. Same thing with your faith. Faith right now is, is, is a trust in, in something not yet seen. But one day you're gonna see it. Love, on the other hand, will never fade away. You will never lose it because that is what eternal life is going to be, is being within the love of the Trinity for all of eternity. So love will only grow. So you need love. Now he turns to the issue of prophecy and of and of tongues. But first he says, this is his point, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So pursue love, desire the gifts. Pursue love, desire the gifts, whatever gifts they might be. It's a good thing to desire other gifts that you might not have. But you need to pursue love. But he says, especially prophecy. <clears throat> So what would have been happening in the church in Corinth it would seem to be that there were those who were speaking in tongues, and they were getting a little cocky. They were like, yes, we are the more spiritual Christians because we speak in tongues. 
We're actually true Christians because we speak in tongues. I came from a speaking in tongues background, and there are groups that are like, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not a Christian. Same problem going on in Corinth, where they say, you know, yeah, that's cool and all that you guys like prophesy, but we speak in tongues. We're the real. And Paul is just trumping that. He's saying, no, prophecy is superior to tongues. It is a better gift than tongues. He's going to explain why that is. So again, the question that maybe we're thinking, is, what is tongues? Is it uh, an unknown um, babbling uh, of the mouth, of an unknown language, or is it a known language just unknown to the speaker? Because he did say in 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, speak in the tongue of angels? Well, maybe Paul's being serious, or maybe he's being facetious, He's going to be a little cheeky. Like, even if I can speak the language of angels, but don't have love, it's just annoying. Like maybe he's just doing that. Maybe it's for a rhetorical impact. For one who speaks in a tongue, speaks not to men, but to God. So again, I raise the question, well, it seems like he's speaking to God, not to men. Maybe it's a, a some sort of heavenly language. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in spirit. It, does everyone's Bible capitalize this S? Anyone have a lowercase S in 1 Corinthians 14 too? Ben doesn't even have his Bible open. I'm just kidding. NASB. NASB lowercase S? NIV. NIV lowercase S? Okay. What do you have? Lowercase S. What do you have? NIV. NIV. The American Standard lowercase Okay, so there's a little bit of disagreement going on. Just so you know, in Greek, there's no capitals. Like, you don't distinguish something with the capital S versus the lowercase s. Um, most, uh, most scripts from the first century, it was all uppercase. It had, like, cap lock on or something. Um, so, so this is interpretive, and there's also not the article the here. So it's just mysteries spirit. So the question is, is it in the Holy Spirit or in... His or her spirit. Are they uttering mysteries in their spirit, or are they uttering mysteries in the Holy Spirit? Good question. Put that one on the table. I think you might answer it as we keep going. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Okay. Look, he has a little purpose statement of prophecy. What does prophecy do? Well, it builds people up. It encourages people, and it comforts people. So if someone is saying, hey, I'm a prophet, and they start speaking to you, and it's not building you up or encouraging you or comforting you, eh, they're probably not exercising the gift of prophecy like described in the New Testament. They're probably just saying things not with love. Okay, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. In case you're like hesitant or scared or like, oh, tongues is weird, we should avoid it at all costs. Well, Paul wants you to speak in tongues. He also wants you to prophesy. So these are at least two things that we shouldn't be fearful of or even hide from because it's actually something that Paul wishes you could all experience and enjoy for some reason. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. So the only way, getting together as, as a group, and then someone speaking in these tongues, is actually good or encouraged, is if someone's there to interpret. So if you've ever known uh, people or, or church traditions where they all just get together and then speak in, in an inaudible tongue, it's not good for the group. It's maybe good for the individual, but not for the group, according to Paul himself right here. Now, brothers, if, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? So his point is that speaking in tongues doesn't benefit other people. If even lifeless instruments, such as a flute or a harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if 
with your tongue you utter speech that is intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. So, musicians know this. Like, like, instruments only sound good when you actually play a chord or you play a harmony. If you just bang on it and make noise, it's just like, ah, what's going on? What's this noise? So, he's saying the same thing with these spiritual gifts. There needs to be clarity around it. So, again, think, yeah, you have a question? Well, go ahead and finish your thought for that observation. Okay. So, so, thinking about whether or not the speaking in tongues is a known language, a known human language, just unknown to the speaker and the hearers of the congregation, or if it's some sort of um, like heavenly like babbling, uh, uh, where you're just making consonants almost uh, with your mouth, consonants and vowels that really mean nothing, but it's an expression of the spirit. I, I think these verses right here, uh, they lean me in one direction. There are doubtless many different languages in the world. And none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in the building up of the church. So just like an instrument, if you just like banged on all the keys of the piano, well, there really are distinct notes in that. It's just I can't understand them. Well, I, I think... Here's like my leaning. I sit on the fence a little bit with it. I lean kind of towards, oh, it is real languages. It's just I don't know them and no one else knows them. They're languages. I just don't know them. So it sounds like that one. Because I don't know it and because they don't know it. Now, I'm, I'm totally comfortable saying that, that the speaking and praying and praising in tongues is also... Um, uh, ununderstandable and unknown languages. It's just a, a babbling of, of the mouth and the tongue and expression of the spirit. I'm totally comfortable with that. I'm just not comfortable doing it in the church service because Paul's not comfortable with it unless there's an interpreter, which we'll see. But let's get to that question first, or the observation we have. So as a young boy in Eastern Oregon, I found myself in the charismatic church assembly of God. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people in that church who were gifted with speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. But when I asked the question, what did he or she say, there was nobody gifted in the interpretation. Mm -hmm. And so I was left with the, the thought that you just expressed is, this is just a bunch of babbling. If, and I was, uh, I was, uh, I didn't, I was a foreigner to the speaker, and he was a foreigner to me, or yeah. she, because there was no meaning to it, and it just uh, took up a lot of time yeah. listening to somebody babble, mm -hmm. and I just was really turned off by that whole yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah, and when we keep reading, he does say, like, you need to have an interpreter there. I, I think a, a really encouraging moment for me, it was during, uh, I had a, it was high school group, it was a bunch of high school guys, and we're sitting around Monday morning, we're praying together, and, and one of the guys, like, he's much more like in line with the charismatic movement, and we're just praying together, and all of a sudden, he just starts like, I, I don't know, it was, it was like, uh, um, like constant vomiting <laughs> all of a sudden, and it's like he couldn't speak but, except for making noise, and then he just said, someone else pray, and like, he just stopped because he couldn't say anything, and then when we were done praying, he was like, that was awesome. But it was like it was totally encouraging for him and for us it was like oh that was a little weird but he knew to say you know there's no one here interpreting so he just stopped and then he was i'm sure he was praying still in tongues and, and praising in tongues uh, but it just wasn't coming out audibly from his mouth and i was like oh look there's someone who who understands the context of how to use uh, and enjoy the gift of speaking in tongues yeah i think uh, you sort of jumped over this but when paul says he wishes that all of us could um, speak in tongues and prophesy yeah, yeah. That's not, which gets twisted by people saying, well, unless you do, right. then you're not a believer. Right. Where Paul's saying an aspiration, but that's not a requirement yes. of yep. faith. Yes. It'd be like saying, man, you're not really a Christian unless you can preach a 40 minute sermon. It's so weird, you know? Um, so he says in verse 1, pursue love. That's what you need to pursue. But desire the gifts, like prophecy and like tongues. Like the gifts that you don't currently possess, because God can manifest himself uniquely, but maybe he won't. Yeah, you had a question? I mean, is there a distinction um, of speaking in tongues, that true spiritual speaking in tongues is a consistent language of someone? 
or does it also include random polysyllabic sounds that someone is to interpret? Uh, I'm saying I'm saying it could go either way in mm -hmm. First Corinthians 14. Yeah, I kind of lean towards <coughs> languages, but I sit on the fence, and I'm totally comfortable with it being how you said polysyllabic. Yeah. Uh, I just go share the gospel with a friend. Does that count as prophecy? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Let's keep going through this, otherwise we will not get through it. And um, I'll see if I answer that question. All right, verse thirteen. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. Oh, also, when we were thinking in verse 2, is it is it utterance of the Holy Spirit or of His Spirit? This verse, my spirit prays, makes me think that that verse 2 should be a lowercase s <laughs> instead of a capital S. So that's actually an utterance of your spirit. That is the tongue. But it can go either way, since it's a manifestation of the spirit chapter 12. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. You are giving thanks in tongues, you're being encouraged, you're giving thanks, you're being built up, but the others are not. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So Paul is all for speaking in tongues. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law, it is written, pause. All right, this is cool. Um, he says in the law, which usually refers to... Old Testament. The first five books of the Bible, usually, the books of Moses, Genesis, and Deuteronomy. But then he quotes from Isaiah, which is a prophetic book. So the law also is a shorthand way of referring to the entire Old Testament for Paul. In the law, it is written, By people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Remember that quote from Isaiah, chapter 28? Why would we? It's so strange. This is a quote from the book of Isaiah, and it's a pronouncement of judgment on Israel, on Ephraim. So um, God is pronouncing a woe through the prophet Isaiah to the people of Israel because they have not listened to his commands, and now Assyria, people of strange and foreign lips, are going to come in and take them into exile. And, and what he's saying is that um, your unbelief is going to face judgment through people who you don't understand what they're speaking. So he's referencing that right here, and then it says, Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. That's confusing, but he clarifies. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, the outsiders or unbelievers enter... Will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and all un and, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Alright, so here, here's what he means by saying, <laughs> tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. So the sign of the lips, or the tongues, in Isaiah 28 is a sign of judgment towards those who don't believe. So to say that tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, it's actually the effect that the tongue has on unbelievers is it takes a hard heart and makes it harder. It hardens an already hard heart. While prophecy, not a sign for unbelievers but for believers, it's for the process of making believers. Prophecy takes a hard heart and it breaks it and softens it to belief. So when it says sign for unbelievers, it, it's, its force and purpose is actually to, to make unbelievers or to harden unbelievers while prophecy being a sign for believers actually leads to believers. So that line's confusing, but these ones 
are clarifying it. If we were all like, yeah, let's speak in tongues in church today, and a few unbelievers came in, or just a, guest, a few guests, they'd be like, these are some wackadoos. <laughs> like, they're so weird. Now, is Paul saying don't speak in tongues? Of course not. He wants us all to speak in tongues. He speaks in tongues more than any of us. He's just saying in your church service, don't do it. It's only for your upbuilding, and it's really weird to an outsider. But you know what's not weird to an outsider? Their, their secrets being revealed to them. Maybe it's a little weird, but to understand them. Like they understand what you're saying when you prophesy as a, as a church, whether individually or as a collective group. So how much better would it be if all of us were able to have the gift of prophecy rather than the gift of tongues? Because it would promote our evangelism we would be more evangelistic and more effective in our evangelism if we had to get to prophecy over the gift of tongues. So that's why he says to pursue that. What then, brothers? We come together, someone had brought their guitar, they have a hymn, someone had a little Bible lesson, maybe a revelation, someone has a tongue or an interpretation of that tongue. Let all things be done in your church service for the building up of each other. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So there is your instructions for how to operate the gift of tongues. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. The others could refer to all of the congregation, or could refer to the other prophets. So just because someone maybe is a prophet in this sense, it's not just like their word goes. It's always weighed. And as we know from 1 Thessalonians, which we'll get to in a few weeks, you weigh it according to Scripture. You're always uh, examining the prophetic words with Scripture itself to see if it lines up. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. In other words, don't speak over each other. That's rude. Don't do that. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So, let your church service have, have flow. The word that Lou uses is literally, <coughs> don't, don't let it be chaotic. Because God is a God of peace. Now we get this little test of what the heck? As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or, or are you the only one it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or a spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized, so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy. And do not forbid speaking in tongues. No. Do not forbid speaking in tongues for all of my, uh, my cessationists in the room. You know, those who have said the sign gifts up. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be, de be done decently and in order. The church worship, worship gathering, a worship service, should be orderly, should be peaceful, should not be chaotic and disordered. There should be a flow to it, or a, a liturgy to it. So what's going on with the whole women should keep silent in the church? This is, not an, this is not and cannot be an absolute statement, because in chapter 11 specifically, Paul references, and he, does not, he, he, he doesn't correct the fact that women are prophesying and praying in the church. He acknowledges it, he recognizes it, and he does not rebuke it. Women in the church in Corinth were praying and prophesying. Let me, just, let me show you that real quick. 1 Corinthians 11, 5. Every, every wife or every woman who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is shameful for her head. It's like she, she's shaving. I'm surprised you guys didn't want to talk about this one. Anyway, um, what, what he acknowledges is that they do pray and prophesy. So women are praying and are prophesying in the church gathering. So whatever this means, it can't just mean that women aren't allowed to speak. It must be in, in how they are speaking. So, so looking through it, some, some details that we might find, we'll, we'll notice here the submission does not have a, a subject of who the submission is to, so we should not assume that it's submission to a man or to men, but rather to God, just as the law says. 
So, so just as a, a man is in submission, a woman is in submission to God. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husband. In the first century, uh, women were not allowed to learn. It was actually viewed as a sin in the Jewish community to teach a woman, whether in private or in public. Jesus lets Mary and Martha sit at his feet and learn. Paul says, let them learn. But women in the first century were uneducated. So what seems to be happening is, one, they were desiring to learn something. Uh, and then, uh, here, or was it from you that the word of God came, or you are you the only one that the word of God reached? That might be referring to all the Corinthians, or maybe to some sort of posture that women in the Corinthian church had, to where there was almost like this, bolster superiority of like, oh, I know what that scripture says. And they were, they were speaking up. But remember, we've actually had this phrase um, to, to not speak or to keep silent. We had it just a little bit ago with the prophets and, and with people in tongues. If there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So what happens if there's not someone to interpret my tongues if I stand up and start speaking in tongues anyways? I'm being disrupted. So I need to not do that. I need to be quiet in that situation. There seems, in the order of things, there are, there are right times for the women to stand and to pray and to prophesy in the church service. But there are also wrong times for a woman, a woman or a man to stand up and say, I got a question about that. Could you go back and explain Genesis 22 like, while, while the lesson is happening? Or, or maybe someone says, I don't actually think that's what that says. They're interrupting the church service. That seems to be, from the context, what Paul is addressing. Because women are praying and women are prophesying, but they just seem to be interrupting in the church service at this time. To where it's probably taking like four hours to get through their one hour service because there's too much interruption. I'll answer your question in a second. The thing I equate it to is middle school ministry, where <laughs> as fun as it was, I loved it. I would, I would, I would draw stuff on the board and then Every now and then I would make the mistake of asking a rhetorical question, and then for, you know how a middle schooler like, raises their hand, like, they do this one? They're like, I am not letting this die away. Like, they're locked in the place. And I ignore it, because I'm not taking questions, and I go on with my lesson, and five minutes go by, and the person is still just locked in there. With, so then finally I'll say, uh, yes, Cameron, what is your question? And they're like, one time my dad got a dog, and the dog also ate the food off the table, like, uh, your kid. It's just like, what are you talking about? You're being so disruptive. That's not the point of what we're doing right now. That's not, that's not the liturgical moment that we're in. I think Paul's just addressing that. Uh, who had the question? No, no, no. So it's shameful for women to speak in church. He's talking about when they're arguing and interrupting. I think so, yeah. Because you it's, sort of said it's, not, it's not shameful for them to prophesy and to pray unless they're doing it with their head uncovered, whatever that means. Yeah, man. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> We're already five minutes over time. <laughs> Let me give you my attempt of a one minute answer to that question. So, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is talking about uh, women having their head covered. I think he's talking about women, not just wives. Um, it, the head covering could be some sort of fabric, or it could just be their long hair. Something that distinguishes the, the gender distinction distinction between the men and the women. The, the head covering, the essence, do you remember that part where he says that, that man is the glory of God, and yet woman is the glory of man? Well, well the reason for that, man, man is the image and glory of God, because God makes man first, and he makes him out of dust. Then he makes woman out of the side of man, Genesis chapter 2. Now, woman is not the image of man. That's Seth, Genesis chapter 5. So a woman is not the image of man, but she is the glory of man. So just in the same way that God's handiwork is displayed in the existence of a man, well, well the woman's existence points to the existence of the man, because she was made from the side. So in that way, she's, she's the glory of man. It has this distinct honor alongside a man, even though she was made by God himself. Now, why would she cover her head in the worship service? In chapter 11, it says that the, the veil, the covering, is the sign of the woman's authority. Not the sign of her submission, but the sign that she has authority. So they come together to worship who? 
God. God. And what the women do is they cover their head, which is the glory of who? God. Man. 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 They are covering the glory of man because that is not who we're here to worship. Probably what the Catholic came up with. Oh, yeah, maybe. 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 Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Uh, head coverings are never mentioned again in the rest of the New Testament. Paul does address hairdos, and he dresses the way men and women should act. So it seems more to be whatever it's referring to is maybe a practice that's taking place in Corinth. Um, but what is highlighted is the distinction and the celebration of gender differences. The differences between men and women should be celebrated in the church service all while we come together to worship God. So I think that's what's going on, Ben, with the coverings. You had a question? I did. This is a specific letter to a specific church at a specific time. Yep. Does it apply forever? Uh, I don't think that we should be wearing, uh, women, you don't need to wear head coverings, but what I do think this text does specifically apply is that guys, we should not try to act and dress like women, and women, you should not try and act and dress like men. Instead, we should celebrate our gender distinctions because God has made us that way. So we are equal in our value, in our status, and yet we are different in our functions and our roles in, in church and in life. So I think that's how it does apply to all of us, but we would not say that we need to start wearing coverings. Because Paul doesn't even say that to other churches. In 1 Timothy, the church in Ephesus, he addresses how their, their hairstyles are, are, are. Uh, you know, not don't don't braid your hair and adorn yourself with gold and, and fancy jewels, but instead adorn yourself with good works. That should be how you dress yourself as, as a woman of God. He doesn't say though, cover your head. Yeah. So there's there's cultural application, but there is also timeless application in this sense. I think the timeless application is to celebrate and embrace gender distinction and how it manifests in the culture. Let me pray for us, and then we'll worship. Father, well, thank you for, for this letter that you, you've given to us through your apostle, Paul. Thank you that he addresses things not, not just with an aims of, of being a more profitable church, but for God, you being more glorified and more honored. And God, that's what we want to do as well. So God, we ask that you would, you would humble us, humble me, and that we would, we would come to your word ready to learn and, and never thinking that our, our first passing that we've had your word mastered. But God, we don't want to we don't want to wrestle your word in submission, but we want to submit to your word and be shaped by it. So God, we ask that you would continue to do that, continue to stir our minds with questions and intrigue as we continue to finish your word this year. We love you and we need you for all this. In Jesus' name, amen.